This man who's about to stand before you has made a mighty contribution to enabling that future, creating it for all of us. I'd like you to welcome Patrick Byrne. Thank you, Jeffrey. And to the gentleman running the AV, I have turned on my mic if you want to uh, activate that, my lavalier or whatever. And I promised Carl I would wear this until I spoke, so I, I figured that as long as I had to wear a necklace, I would switch to my, rather than the PVC pipe the rest of you were wearing, I'd switch to my bodhisattva of compassion and love. Is this working, this mic? Let's try it again. Huh. Well, it's okay. Fortunately, we have a backup. I highly recommend if you are ever introduced anywhere, you want Jeffrey Tucker doing your introduction. Because, <laughs> thank you, Matt. Because he does it with such grace and elegance and class and makes a chicken salad look like lobster salad. <laughs> or as I make. Okay, well, I, I spoke at Porkfest last summer and I opened up saying that they, uh, you know, you, you invite a philosopher to come talk to you, you, you run the risk of a guy getting up and talking a lot of philosophy, which is what I did last summer. And now I'll give you a different warning. You invite a business guy to come and talk to you, you, you run the risk of hearing a bunch of economics. But I'm going to talk about education. And the honor of my life, frankly, was that Milton Friedman, my Milton and Rose Friedman, uh, all bow, alhamdulillah, <laughs> praise be upon their names, uh, shortly before they passed, called me and asked me if I would lead the, the Ro Milton and Rose Friedman Foundation for school choice. Uh, and there's a reason that Milton and Rose, in the last 10 years of their lives, sunk it all their energy, their money, their convictions, and their, uh, you know, their commitment into the fight for school choice. And I started looking, so uh, I do that in my spare time now, the, the uh, Friedman Foundation, but there's a lot of questions that as a business person, and I wonder, do we yet have my lavalier? Uh, could, could whoever is running the AV turn on my lapel mic, please? That's on. And the fellow was just up briefing me about all the mistakes I could make. It's okay, I'll just stand here like. Well, no, that's okay. Here's a... I'll, leave it, I'll leave it down like this. We'll just, how about if I do this? I'll take it out. That's even better. Uh, so <clears throat> I warn you in advance, you're gonna see some numbers and some graphs. I'm gonna remind you for a few minutes like a, uh, like a college economics lecture, but I promise there are no numbers or math beyond what, your, uh, what a sixth grader can follow. And if you'll give me just sort of 10 minutes of looking at some numbers, I think you'll be astounded. First, gotta take you back to that introductory college economics class, what's wrong with monopolies? Well, we remember price and quantity, supply, demand, and where supply and demand meet, you get a market clearing price in any good, which, whatever you're talking about. Where they meet, it's your market clearing price. And at that price, the supply and demand balance, and so society gets that much stuff. Of whatever it is we're talking about, that's how much stuff society gets of it. That quantity times that price gives you that, that rectangle, that amount of stuff. But suppose a monopolist comes in and is able to set a price artificially high. Well, where the price and, and where the monopolist price and demand meet is now, has now shifts to that point, and society ends up getting that much stuff. And so they end up getting this much less of their stuff, and they pay that much more for it. And when you multiply those two things together, you get the extra amount that the monopolist gets from society. The monopolist is able to extract the monopolist rent. 
And you should be aware that economists use the word rent different than you and I, than, than normal humans use them, in that they think into, yeah, you can buy an apartment block and sell and, and, and let people move in and pay you rents, but you can also go and buy yourself a customs official in Paraguay and extract rent from the relationship. You can buy a regulator and extract rent out of having the regulator to, so a rent is just something you invest in and then you extract something from society. And that's the amount that, the extra amount that monopolists if a, get to steal from society, that's called the monopolist rent. And that's what's wrong with monopolies, says standard economic theory. That's what's wrong, that's why we don't like monopolies. So I'd like to talk about an industry that is largely a monopoly in the United States. Not, it's 96 per, there's one, it's 96% concentrated, well beyond. I mean, that, that's why the Department of Justice has a special division just to fight people getting monopolies, because when they get monopolies, they're able to extract this extra rent from you and me. Well, there's an industry that is a 96% concentration. It's so monopolistic. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that industry. It's called the government uh, education industry. Now, nothing changes about the nature of these dynamics of a monopoly just because the government happens to own the, the industry. The basic principles of monopoly still apply. And when I first started getting involved in school choice, I thought, gee, as a business guy, I want to know three things. How much do we spend on K through 12 education? How many students go? And so how much does it cost us per student? First questions you would ask. Now, what's amazing, well, it turns out there's this huge discourse, as you know, about how we don't spend enough on education and people don't love education and words, words, words. You have to, but um, the, how much of it is actually fact-based and actually talks about what those numbers are is surprisingly thin. But there is one publication that you can turn to each year. Uh, it's called The Condition of Education. The federal government puts it out. And these numbers are actually accurate. I want to, the numbers I'm going to show you come from either the government or the teachers union. So they're not from me. And I'm going to show you where they, so, so that's not to suggest that we can trust them, but we can trust them not to be, you know, not to understate the problem. Condition of education says, how much do we spend on total education in America? Well, in 2010 to 2011, State and local each spent about 260, 275 million, and at the federal level, there was another 100 or something. If you add it all up, it comes to 625 billion. Now, that was five years ago, four years ago, and if you add just standard 4.5% inflation to that, which is, again, a conservative estimate, this year we'll spend about 800 billion. $800 billion as a country on K through 12 education. So let's fill in that first number. How much do we spend as a society on education? It's $800 billion. By the way, I'm super pro. I love teachers. Teachers are sacred. Teaching is a sacred profession in my mind. So this is not a bash on teachers. But just think it's, you know, they call it fact-based decision making in business. You just, before you even talk about what you should do, let's get some basic facts. We spend 800 billion as a nation. How many students go to K through 12? Well, U.S. public school enrollment a couple years ago was there's the there's 2012 to 13. The enrollment was at K through 8 was 35 million. Another 15 in high school. So the total is 50 million 50 million kids. 50 million kids go to public schools in America, or as, as Milton insisted, never liked the phrase public education, called it government education. My lap, ah, okay, hallelujah, thank you. That was my error, because I suggested to the gentleman I would probably save the uh, Lavalier, or whatever they call it, these, for later, so I took it by surprise. So 50 million people, kids go, so let's fill that number in, 50 million. Well, if we're spending $800, $800 billion on 50 million kids, this is the sixth grade math problem, how much are we spending per kid? $16,000 per student. 
Just letting you know, as a society, we're spending $16,000 per student. Now, state by state, people always say, well, we're spending under that, this and that, which of course can't be true. Not, you know, not everyone in this room can be shorter than the average height in the room. There's gotta be somebody over the average height and somebody under the average height. And the reason the way they get away with saying, well, we spend less is because they don't count a whole bunch of the things they spend. They say, well, we're not gonna count the teacher's pension as this kind of expense. We're gonna count it as that kind of this, that. At the end of the day, the federal government, and there's a great guy, Cato, who has kind of unscrambled the 17 little buckets that they hide these things in. It's, it's $16,000 per student. Whether you build the model from the ground up or from the top down, we're spending $16,000 per student as a country. Now, let's get to the interesting stuff. Oh, by the way, that $16,000 per student is 39% higher than the average of the OECD. The, there's about 30 industrialized countries in the world, the OECD. This is the highest by far of any of them, and it's 39% higher than the average, and incidentally, our educational results are at about the 26th. We're at the 26th, you know, we're, we're right at the bottom of the 30 industrialized countries, but we're spending 40% more than the average. So I know that this is, uh, this is how a business guy looks at problems. Uh, uh, I know it may be a little, lot, a little much to hear after a nice dinner like that, but you came for some content, so here's some content. We spend 39% more than the average industrialized country and our results are essentially D minus. So, those are the facts. Let's look at four arithmetic problems. We're spending $16,000 per child. How many children are there to the average teacher? Well, again, this is from the NEA itself, and it matches what the federal government numbers are, is that we're, we have 15.9, call it 16 kids per teacher in the government school systems. It's 24 kids per class, but there's 1.23 teachers per classroom, and so on and so forth. 16 kids per teacher. So, if the average teacher has 15.9 kids and we're spending $16,000 per kid, again, sixth grade math, $16,000 per child times 15.9, that's $255,000 per teacher in the public school system. Now, I don't know about you, I do know some public school teachers, my general impression is none of them are making 255,000. In fact, what are they making? Well, we can go to the expenditure, so expenditure per teacher, $255,000. How much do a teacher in a classroom cost? The Bureau of Labor Statistics, you go there and you look up what is it to be a public school teacher, and they make on average $54,740. It's average public school teacher. And of course, you have to have a benefit load, which the teachers union themselves say is 27%. The NEA, the National Education Association, is the national union of teachers, 27%. So you do that, you come to 69,000, call it 69,520, call it $70,000. It's what it actually costs in the direct compensation and the 27% the benefits load to pay a teacher. Now you have an average classroom is 1,000 square feet, a little bit under it, but 1,000 square feet, if you just think in terms of $20 for rent and cam, which is actually in most parts of the country, that's sort of reasonable nice office space. So I can tell you that to put together, to pay $20 a foot, including common area maintenance, heat, light, electricity, people to sweep the floors, wax the floors, hallways, all that stuff. What's that actually cost? $20 a foot is generous. So that's $20,000. So if you say, well, it costs $70,000 to, to pay a teacher to take her 16 kids, and it costs $20,000 to have the classroom, you add those together, you get $90,000 in, in cost. Is what it costs to put a teacher up in front of a group of kids in a classroom and the cost of the classroom and the, the heating, the lighting, the air conditioning, the sweeping, the, you know, every, everything, uh, that's about $90,000. So, the obvious question is, 
If we're spending $255,000 per teacher, and it costs $90,000 to pay the teacher and give him or her the classroom and everything associated with the actual physical space, what the question is, what's the question? Where's the other $165,000 go? Here's my theory. Here's my guess. That's where it is. Now, whenever we, whenever you try to talk about this, they'll trot out the local teachers and say, oh, you hate the teachers. I love the teachers. I adore the teachers. Teaching is a sacred profession. You may notice I wear Chinese, I wear Chinese clothes. My instincts are quite Confucian in this regard. In fact, the, the thing I admire, maybe the only thing I really admire about the communist Chinese was when, the, when they took over in 49, they eliminated Chinese, is, I speak Chinese, uh, Chinese is filled with honorifics. I would refer to, you know, you as little brother and little sister and uncle this. Uh, you speak, you're always speaking with honorifics. The Chinese came in, they eliminated all of it. Everyone became comrade. From the street sweeper to the chairman of the party, it was comrade sweet, street sweeper, comrade chairman, and everybody in between with one exception. I once in a classroom, I can't believe this, referred to a teacher as comrade teacher, and there was this gasp, because it turns out there's one profession that does not, that you're never a comrade. It's its own special sacred thing in the Chinese worldview. You're, you're not on that ladder. If you're a teacher, you, it's a sacred, sacred calling. So I love the teachers, but I've known from experience, having been fighting this fight publicly for over 10 years, they bring out the teachers to say, oh, you must not like them. I love them. The problem is behind, Besides that local high school you see, there are layers and layers and layers that you never see. The federal, the state, the county, and the district. That's where the money's going. That's where the money's going. It's not, it's all, you know, they're always trying to make it a big against you and your local high school. It's not about you and your local high school. It's about all these layers that nobody sees behind that. So here's a better idea to which Milton and Rose Friedman dedicated the last decade of their life. They proposed it in 1955 in an article to do things this way, but they, they fought the last 10 years of their life for this. Let children withdraw from the government schools. And I, at this point, I have to draw attention to Kate Baker, who has fought the fight, the good fight here in... We're not worthy, we're not worthy. Uh, let children withdraw. Save the $16,000. Oh, by the way, the teachers, uh, the union always says, well, you don't save the money when the kids leave. To which I have two responses. One is when a, a new kid comes to school, the guild, the system says, well, we need more funding. But a kid leave because it is more expensive even if you had a kid. But if a kid leaves, they say, well, it doesn't really save you money, any money. You still have to have the teacher. You can't have it both ways. It's got to be one or the other. They can't have it both ways. And in addition, the truth, the, the, the truth is, you know, they, they say that because they say, well, everything's fixed. Everything's fixed. Well, if everything's fixed, then you don't need more money when you add a student. So you shouldn't need more money when you subtract. And in addition, I was taught, I grew up, and I had a lot of tailwinds in life. And one of them was my great mentor. When I was 13, I met this pharma, farmer from Nebraska who taught me a lot about life and kind of took me under his wing and guided my business career. And he was always teaching me about, you know, if a, a farmer owns 100 acres and each acre grows 350 bushels of corn and the price of corn, all this stuff, he would teach me this way for years. When I was about 20, he penned an essay. His name had never been in the press. He penned an essay that showed up in Barron's, and a very thoughtful essay. His name was Buffett. And, and that guy from Nebraska went on, and he really went places. But he, uh, uh, he taught, and I used to work for him. I ran a group of his companies. And one thing he taught me is there is no such thing as a fixed cost. There's no such thing as a fixed cost. At the end of the day, there are costs that take you two or three years to get out of on a spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, there are costs that take you two or three minutes to get out of. And there is no such thing as a truly fixed cost. So 
kid withdraws, you can save $16,000. You may have to give each kid who withdraws a scholarship for $8,000. The net savings is $8,000. What's the fiscal effect of that? Well, just to frame it for you, assume 20% of kids take the deal. 20% of 50 million kids in this country would be 10 million kids. You save 8,000 on each, $80 billion in savings. To frame the scope of that, take the US in the heart of the last financial crisis. 2009, the National Conference of State Legislatures got together and they wrote this report about how the states were gonna go bankrupt and they were freaking out. And it was because of the budget gap in 2009, for 2009 in the middle of the financial crisis came to, of all the states together, came to $62 billion. So in other words, if the states passed these vouchers or tuition tax credits, as you've done here in New Hampshire, there's various flavors of school choice and 20% of kids take the deal, we can wipe out. We, the, there is no state budget crisis. California would take about 25%. There'd be no state budget crisis. You know, they're letting prisoners out of prison in California rather than let kids have a choice about whether they stay in the public school system or take a deal like this. They could do it. Well, I'm, yeah, I think they should let about half of them out. No victim, no crime. I just, was that in your, was that in reason this month? A an article, no victim, no crime? Or, uh, also, what else it can do? It can eliminate the disparity in educational achievements between black and white. And just, there was recently, Harvard published a study which confirmed, which those of us in the, that movement have been well aware of, uh, they were talking about a very tiny voucher that was instituted in an area of New York City. It was like $1,800 or something 15 years ago, but it's been long enough that they were able to study the effects. And what they found was kids who were taking the vouchers were 24%, African-American kids were 24% more likely to go to college by having taken the voucher, and 100% more likely to go to a selective college they close the gap at the rate of two years of underachievement for every year they're in a voucher program. And these are all based on random assignment. You know, the gold standard of, of, of sociology is random. When the vouchers first came out and kids started doing better, the opponents of freedom would say, well, that's because their parents are more motivated and they went and fought to get them the vouchers and that's why you can't pay attention to that data. Well, now most all of these voucher programs are random assignment. There's one voucher and seven kids apply for it. So it, it, give, it lets you have random assignment, which is the gold standard of these kinds of studies. And Friedman Foundation put this out. The new report is the 11th gold standard study that considers vouchers effects that, uh, that have shown that the positive effect vouchers have. They have incredible effects on you know, the, the DC voucher program, which I was involved with has a 93% parental approval rate, way, way higher than the, than the government school system. The rates of kids going on to college, the difference between black and white achievement narrows. It's like I say, it's two years for every year they're in the voucher program. So, which makes me think, I've always felt, I don't know about you, but I've, I have always felt that the, the real last bastion of racism in America is the guilty white left. That's the only, I haven't heard, that's where in the last 20 years, when I hear sort of racist mutterings, that's where it comes from. It's, uh, they're the, because, and they're the people who think that the system we have now is tolerable. They don't think, they have kind of an attitude, oh, what are you gonna do? Yeah, there's this, there's schools in East LA that they wouldn't let their kids walk across the campus, but the school has a higher, a kid there has a higher chance of in high school of getting raped, mugged, shot, something like that, than they are of graduating on time with an average skill set. And I mean, the schools are so bad, and the same people who wouldn't let their kids walk across that campus fight the idea that those kids could get a voucher for half of what's being spent on them anyway. So one thing that it does is it gives great educational 
Well, one thing it does is it wipes out our fiscal crisis at the state level if we did this. Second thing it does is it has tremendous benefit uh, educationally for black kids, for white kids, for the kids who defect, for the kids who stay in the system. There's really good evidence that as children start defecting from the government school system, the government school system starts reforming itself. And it takes about 10 or 15 percent defection rate, and that's been documented in Maine and Vermont, where there is a kind of a, has a long-term voucher-like system. So I'm going to make one plug. If any of you want to have some extra money that you don't want to give to the Free State Project or anything bigger, go to the Friedman Foundation and, and slip them a couple bucks. Uh, the philosophical effect of vouchers. Lincoln said, the philosophy of the classroom today is the philosophy of government tomorrow. And Milton used to say, a socialist school system will create socialist values, and a free market school system will create free market values. There's a book uh, by Andrew Coulson from Cato on the history of education in America, and actually it sort of goes deeper than that, or longer term than that. It's very clear that the government school system was created by a bunch of folks where the advocates were what we would now call progressives. And their fear were there were these kind of vermin showing up on our shores, Catholics and Jews, basically. And these, they had to be Americanized, they had to be taught, they had these bad values that we could, Horace Mann and these guys, it was all a method of indoctrination. If you, you know, where does it first, the first public school systems come out of the Prussian state? If you have an authoritarian state, you have to have a method of indoctrinating kids. The, what we are fighting intellectually is deeply tied up with the government school system. And that's why there are people who fight so bitterly against changing this, because they understand their grip on the political system will slip if, they, if, if kids are not forced for the first 13 years of their education through the indoctrination system they create. In conclusion, vouchers eliminate all the budget deficits in the, at the state, in the states with 20% usage, they improve educational results for all students as 11 academic, peer-reviewed academic studies have now demonstrated. There's no serious question on this anymore and increases black college going by 24% and selective college going by 100%. This is one of the most obvious no-brainers uh, there is in politics today. So what blocks vouchers? Well, I'd like to point out the NEA, and it's, not, uh, it's really not just the union. I don't think of it as the union. Think of it as a guild. There's this whole system. It's the, it's the union plus all this, these levels that you don't normally think about, the district, the county, the state, the federal. That's, they, they've got a fantastic business going. They, got to, they get to extract this hundreds of billions of dollars of monopolist rent out of the system, and they're fighting. And I'd like to point out, when I spoke at Free State Project, I mean, at the Pork Fest, I, I mentioned this story about how in 2007, Somebody said, I went to, I, I got in a big fight with Wall Street in the, in around 2004. I, oddly enough, I saw, I was a public, we went public in 02. By 0, and I quickly saw, when you're a public company CEO, you're out there mixing it up with hedge funds and prime brokers and stuff. And I was schmoozing around with these guys. It became very clear there was a bunch of illegality going on. I was asked to take part in it. I knew all about it. And in 2004, 05, I just sort of kept notes and, in 05, I just went public, did a big press conference and told everybody, look, Wall Street is corrupt, it's corrupt to the core, this is what they're doing, they're trading on inside information gained through expert network systems, they're doing, they got a way of rigging the market in different areas. The SEC that we think is protecting us is actually either asleep at the switch or in, the, in bed with Wall Street, and the whole system's gonna melt down. I started saying that very loudly in 05, and the New York Post started running uh, pictures of me with UFOs coming out of my head. What, the SEC's in bed with Wall Street? What is this, a conspiracy theory? No, oh, it's called ca regulatory capture. But in 07, a very well-known hedge fund guy sat me down, another guy there heard all this, sat me down and said, Patrick, I want to tell you something. 
You opened up the conversation saying, Patrick, I want you to know you're the single most hated man I've ever known in my life. You could kill, but you used to be kind of a golden boy on Wall Street, but now you could kill people and we wouldn't hate you like we hate you in this town. Which, of course, you can carve on my tombstone that in January 07, this was the most hated man on Wall Street. Well, you know how much the NEA hates like Walmart and Starbucks? I mean, think of how much the, the unions hate Walmart. Well, the NEA put out a list of their public enemies, public enemies, and guess what? Starbucks is number three, Walmart's number two, I'm number one. We're number one. <laughs> so you can put that on my tombstone too, that while I was the most hated man on Wall Street in 2007, and I'm public enemy number one as far as the NEA is concerned. <laughs> that's high, high praise. Uh, that's who they and all the apparatus who aren't union necessarily, but all the administration and these other levels of government are what hate this idea and they're fighting it. And that's because they're extracting a monopolist rent from it. So I think that's the single most important fight we have to win the fight for freedom is to change the school system. And by changing the school system, we don't have to get involved in fights about you know, this is what I love about vouchers or school choice. And there's lots of forms of school choice. The most minimum form is, you know, your kid goes to any public school they want and the money goes with them. They call that backpack funding out in Oakland. The next step is charter schools. Yeah, you start getting more choice. The next step, the full step is vouchers or educational tax credits. And at a deep, deep level, it's what will make our progress and our victories permanent. If, if we can keep them from continuously having access to re no matter what victories we win, if the kids are back in getting re-indoctrinated in a socialist school system and socialist values, we'll have to keep winning these victories over and over again. And we don't have to get involved in fights, in my view, about what is the right way to fix the school system in terms of should this be the curriculum or that be the curriculum. Just let there be, let a hundred flowers bloom. Let kids withdraw, take a voucher for half of what's being spent on them, leave the rest in the industry. So everybody's better off. If your kid withdraws, takes the voucher, they're better off or else they wouldn't withdraw. The kids who are left in the system are better off because they, they get more money being spent on them per child. The taxpayer is better off because you can achieve this with no increase in taxes. You get more money being spent per child in the government school system, so they're better off, the taxpayer is better off, the kid who leaves better off. There's one group that isn't better off and it's that group. And they've got this huge machine to cloak from the, the world what the real interests are here. But I think it's the same, you know, I, there's a reason that our great, uh, there's not a person in this room who doesn't know who Milton Rose Friedman is, I'm sure, and the contribution they made in their lengthy lives to the cause of liberty. Uh, I think he was the greatest friend of it in the 20th century, was Milton Friedman. Uh, uh, there's a reason they spent the last 10 years of their life making this their single dedication, their single most important fight was getting school choice. And if we can win there, and I know we're making really good progress. When I took over the foundation 10 years ago, being chairman, we had 18 hundredths of 1% of kids were in voucher programs. As of this year, it's three quarters of 1%. And by the rate we're going, it looks like next year we'll be at about 1%. We only have to get to two or 3% competition before the whole monopoly we're up against starts to, to crumble. So my understanding of the schedule for the rest of the evening is Nick Gillespie is going to come and interrogate me and we're going to be here till the sun comes up if you want. So thank you very much.